Our the penult penultimate set of speakers. Um, Matthew Shapiro and Roxanne Foss. Um, Matthew Shapiro is with UC Cooperative Extension. Roxanne Foss is with the Volmar Natural Lands Consulting. And they are going to speak to us about munch that grass, biomass reductions reduce fire hazards. Good afternoon. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, I'm Matthew, as Paul mentioned. I work in Ventura and Santa Barbara counties as the Livestock and Range Advisor with Cooperative Extension, and uh, my co-presenter and co-lead on this project is Roxanne Foss. We're going to be doing a little bit of a tag team, so bear with us if there's any technical difficulties. Uh, but we're going to be talking about a three-year statewide uh, field-based research project where we've examined, we've, we've tried to examine this relationship between uh, grazing and fire behavior. And I think what you'll hear from us is a little bit of repetition of what you've heard thus far today, um, but also hopefully some complementarity, uh, in particular with Felix's presentation. Again, this work was field-based as opposed to Felix's uh, model-based effort, and it'll be interesting. I actually haven't personally compared the numbers that our two projects have derived. So it'll be interesting uh, to work through that as an audience. Um, it's been alluded in Felix's presentation and others that it's sort of an obvious intuitive concept, right? That if you graze, you reduce fire behavior, you're reducing fine fuel, you're reducing grass biomass. Clearly, uh, fire behavior must be reduced as well. What was interesting to us as we embarked on this project is that sort of obvious or intuitive thing really isn't yet supported in the scientific literature, or at least isn't sort of quantitatively derived. And so what we're hoping is that this project in particular, that the real novel contribution is to be able to, to provide the range nine community, the fire suppression community with really hard numbers uh, to be able to understand the, this relationship that we'll be describing. As I mentioned, our project uh, was statewide in nature. We had nine sites across four different uh, vegetation zones. We uh, structured this project where we opportunistically took advantage of prescribed burns that were ha already happening in grassland areas across the state. What that meant is that we burned in all sorts of different seasons, spring, summer, and fall. We burned predominantly in annual grasslands, although there was some perennial grassland component to our burns. This is a photo of one of our plots. So at every one of those nine sites, we had anywhere between three to six plots that took this form. Uh, they were rather modestly sized, six meters wide, 10 meters long, and they had four, or they had three treatments and they had a control. So on the left there, you can see uh, our control strip, uh, which was in all cases unmanipulated and in all cases above 2,000 pounds per acre. And then we had three very deliberate uh, treatment strips, uh, 1250, 750, and 250 pounds per acre that was sort of roughly sort of qualitatively intended to be light grazing, moderate grazing, and heavy grazing. We uh, installed T-posts at zero, five, and 10 meters distance. And those serve two purposes. One was for us to be able to measure a uh, rate of spread of the fire as we lit it. And the second was we also took photographs during fire and measured flame lengths against those T-posts. We also had metal strips that we painted temperature sensitive paints on and embedded at the soil surface. And we're able to measure fire temperature as a proxy for fire intensity. This is a, a photograph of another site. It's a little confusing because the treatment strips are uh, inverted in this particular photo, but we've chosen it as an, a good example to both sort of communicate what it looked like when we were burning and how we burnt it. So again, these were prescribed fires, so we were able to really manipulate the, the manner in which we burned. The treatment strips were lit simultaneously, and we measured again rate of spread, so how fast the fire was moving, and then took photographs like these to get a flame length. A third plot, again confusing because the treatment strips are inverted, but uh, the purpose here is to demonstrate just sort of the, the different nature of burning across our different treatment strips. In some cases, the strips didn't burn at all. Uh, after the burn, we went ahead and did uh, surveys of abiotic and vegetative cover as well. So we wanted this work to have management relevant outcomes, and we really wanted to weave together 
uh, principles of range management with ideas and concepts that fire suppression and fire agency personnel and professionals could understand. And Felix alluded to this chart, but this is one example of how we hope to communicate the results from this project. Uh, this is called the hauling chart that firefighters are well aware of. There's kind of a lot going on here, but what I want to draw your attention to are these colored bars, which represent different flame height critical thresholds. In the bottom right of the graph, you can see the different flame height lengths. And so, for example, and Felix again alluded to this, four feet is a really critical threshold in firefighting. It's considered that if flame heights are above four feet, that it's unsafe for firefighters on hand crews to conduct direct attack and fire suppression efforts. And so if us as range managers can manage and pre-treat range lands in such a manner that it keeps flame lengths below four feet, that's a really critical success in the context of this sort of weaving together of range management and uh, firefighting. So with that, I'm going to pass it to Roxanne. So I'm going to talk you through a little bit of the variables we were interested in. On your far left are the stratification or selected or manipulated variables that we had control over. So the primary element of interest was the treatment. Uh, so those three treated areas, and this was the biomass. So we're looking at pounds per acre in this case. The second one is slope. We also stratified by zero to 10, 10 to 20, 20 to 40, and then above 40, we actually excluded based on access and safety. We also stratified by vegetation zones. We tried to target areas in Northern California coast, Central coast, South coast, and then the Central Valley foothills region. The weather variables identified here, so we have the temperature, relative humidity, so how dry it is, um, and then the wind speed. All of these are going to be lower than a typical wildfire setting because these are prescribed burns, and so we were limited in that case. So just kind of keep that in mind as we talk through some of these results, um, but they are kind of at a lower intensity than you would see in a wildfire setting. Um, the last one is the dependent variables. This is the fire behavior that we were interested in. These were the characteristics we were monitoring in the field when it was burning. The flame height, so not only were we looking for that threshold, but what height it was um, in relation to the T-post. The passing of 10 meters, so the plot that you saw laid out was 10 meters long. Each of those strips are one meter wide, and we wanted to see whether or not the fire was able to pass that 10 meter point or if it was extinguished prior to that based solely on our biomass manipulation. We also looked at the cover of burned vegetation, ash, we included white ash and black ash. Um, all of this is going to be included uh, in the next graph. You'll see um, anything that was burned. The rate of spread is how quickly the fire moved from point A to point B. We looked at zero to five and then five to 10 meters and the average movement across the entire 10 meters. Then we also look at surface temperature from the strips that had the, the paint. So essentially, if it melted, we knew it passed a certain threshold of temperature, and that's how hot it got on the ground level. So again, we're focusing on the treatment, the biomass. Um, we were able to stratify by these other um, variables, but in terms of managers, um, the results that we're presenting are across all zones and across all slopes. And then the dependent variables that came out of interest that were showing us kind of significant variation based on biomass were the flame height, um, whether or not past 10 meters, and then the cover of uh, burned biomass. So the first graph here starts us up at our upper level of thresholds. Um, you'll be seeing kind of a menu option of thresholds uh, at the end of these three uh, graphs. And this is the top tier. So 3,500 pounds per acre, you're seeing a threshold of 99% of vegetation beyond that is going to be burned. This is based on a predicted value that was applied to our data. Another piece of information I thought was kind of interesting, if you scan over, you'll notice that it's a near vertical wall of data up to about 14 grams per square foot, which is 1,400 pounds per acre approximately. Um, so everything below that was highly variable. So that's patchy. That's, you know, we can't really control it, but it's, um, it's variable to whether it's going to be super burned or less burned based on the weather conditions as well. And then once you get in between those two, it's above 75% burned. So that's kind of an important point if you're looking to burn Medusa head, for example. If you have a, an operation where you need to rest it so you can reach a certain biomass threshold to burn enough vegetation to reach your main goal. So this is our second tier, so 2,500 pounds per acre. You're looking at a decision tree. So essentially, we feed the decision tree our data, and it tells us how it parses out in an interesting and significant way. We fed it all of the variables I described earlier, and biomass uh, was the critical factor that it identified. 
And you can see the threshold here is so 26 uh, is the grams per square feet. That translates to the 2,500 pounds per acre. And so the threshold being here, if you go below 2,500 pounds per acre, it is a very, very low chance that that fire in a prescribed fire setting is going to exceed four feet. And that's the, the point from the hauling graph that um, we identified earlier. So we're really interested in that threshold, which for comparison, that's looking at a lightly grazed landscape um, on the coast. If you have a highly productive landscape on, you know, prairie, something like that, you are bringing it down maybe a thousand pounds per acre. But some areas in San Joaquin never even reach that site, or biomass, I should say. Um, the other point I wanted to note is that it's only a, a 36% of our data that was exceeding the four feet flame height. And to keep in mind the prescribed burn setting. So amplify that for a wildfire setting. So this is kind of the, the lowest threshold um, that you would want to see for for managing for that height. So here we have a two part um, threshold. So we have, this is now on our Y axis, we have the proportion of the treatments that were stopped by 10 meters. So that's whether or not the fire was able to pass the edge of our treatment. So that's 10 meters long. And you can see that there's a really big distinction on one end and the other. So on the far left, you can see that yes, 93% were stopped by 10 meters if it was less than 400 pounds per acre. So that's, you know, in these earlier discussions, we saw what that looked like on the ground. That's really heavily grazed. Um, this is something you'd be managing for in a contract around houses in Wui, um, something where you want to make sure the fire is stopping. This is a, a fire line level treatment. Then the other end of the spectrum, you see that 13 grams per square feet or, 20, or 1,250 pounds per acre represents the edge where it's just going to go past. Your, your grazing is not stopping that fire. So, and again, prescribed fire setting, so it's likely even lower in a wildfire setting that you'd want to be stopping that fire. So that comes into play more in those outer pastures that aren't around critical infrastructure or homes that you might be thinking about something in the middle here, which is a little bit more maybe a sweet spot to maintain your soil integrity, some of those other values that we have when we're managing for a lot of ecologically diverse areas. So in this case, it's a 400 to a 1250 pounds per acre, and our data, approximately 34 of those were stopped. So you have a chance of stopping a fire by grazing it to this kind of moderate to heavy level. And that's something that I think a lot of folks see in the field, including what we saw um, with a lot of those visual perceptions of the fire lines stopping at a grazed pasture. So this is kind of the menu um, of options that you can select from when you have a series of goals that you're looking for and you have kind of the spread across the landscape um, and where you're going to be applying each of these um, biomass thresholds that you're managing for. We've got the 3,500 pounds per acre on the upper end. So this is where maybe you're managing for this to treat a specific target invasive species. Um, you've got the 3,500 to 2,500 pounds. So this is a, a lightly grazed pasture or ungrazed, depending on your setting. Um, so this in a water fire setting is probably going to be above four feet flame heights, and the majority will be burned. Um, once we get down into this, I feel like these bottom three are more the tiers that we as managers are looking at and putting potentially on the tracks. Um, so the 2,500 to the 1,250 light to moderate grazing. This is what I see in a lot of public lands as they want above 1,000, as you heard Allison mention. So these are likely below four feet, but the fire won't be stopped. So it's important to recognize that if you are looking for fire line stopping, you're going to be managing for one of these lower thresholds. So 1,250 pounds per acre to 400, that's a potential it might be stopped, and you're keeping it to a safer um, containment um, height for a uh, flame height below four feet. And then the bottom tier is again that fire line below 400 pounds per acre. Those are your goat and sheep operations and backyards, you know, things like that, fire lines, things where that is the primary goal, even though you might be sacrificing some of your soil health or your regeneration of desired plant communities. So we, in a different way, wanted to communicate this to you visually. And we selected a series of photographs uh, to, to, again, sort of help range managers who are looking at grass all the time remember what some of these levels look, uh, some of the levels that Roxanne uh, really nicely described numerically. I was going to repeat some of what Roxanne just sort of went through as we went through each of these slides. I think for the sake of time and hoping that we have uh, some questions, I'll move a little bit more quickly through these slides. But here you can see this, you know, this is what an ungrazed site looks like, in, in, at least in Santa Barbara County on a particular year uh, in the fall. So clearly way more than 3,500 pounds per acre. Again, not safe for fire, at least from a firefighter's perspective, 
um, with direct attack on the ground. This is a site also in Santa Barbara County that hits that sort of second threshold band between 2,500 and 3,500 to Roxanne's point at some sites in California that are less productive. This might be an ungrazed site still at more productive sites. This might even still be a lightly grazed site. So this is a light, what we're, we're, what we're calling light to moderate grazing, this third band is from between 2,500 to 1,250. I'll go back and just mention the question was brought up earlier, you know, is there compatibility or what is the incompatibility between how we graze for fire safety and how we graze for general good range management as it applies to minimum RDM guidelines. We probably could have put together a nice graphic to really demonstrate that, but I want to just draw your attention that, you know, this lower number here of 1250 is sort of right at uh, the lowest or excuse me, the highest minimum RDM guideline, meaning that, uh, you know, if you graze above this level, you're sort of safe uh, in that context uh, from not having negative impacts to the soil resource and uh, having adequate sort of regeneration of the range the following year. That gets a little more complicated in this, uh, in this next band between 1250 and 400, as Roxanne began to describe. Here you see a visual representation of it, but just understand that those minimum, minimum RDM guidelines place different places in California sort of within this category. And so really sort of balancing objectives, of course, as has been discussed all afternoon is really critical. And then an image from San Joaquin County of what uh, grazing down to below 400 pounds per acre looks like. And that was a, a land manager who was very concerned about fire, having had two fires in the last five years, destroyed most of his infrastructure. So he was doing that on purpose. Um, and uh, so here's the caveats and future research. Uh, we talked through a little bit about how prescribed fire versus wildfire settings are different, and it's important to think about with this data. Um, if this was mode, so these were line trimmed plots, not grazed, as was mentioned earlier, it changes the fuel bed characteristics. We are hoping to expand um, the study to look at grazed areas and also larger, which is the next point, pasture scale level burning and grazing to see what the fire behavior would be there at that setting. Um, one point not mentioned here, but you know, Matthew is also really interested in is manipulating the fire weather. So trying to understand at a, a faster rate throughout the burn day what's happening um, with the fire behavior um, in within each of these treatments. And then the last thing was the other management goals should be considered. I feel like all of us as range ecology people, you know, we've got all these different goals that we're working for, and you know, these kinds of menu options are are there to pick from based on the other goals and across the landscape. Great. I know we're running out of time, but it's important to recognize that the Rescici Rangeland and Cattle Endowment uh, completely funded this work and was really critical, really critical to getting it done and the list of our project partners uh, throughout the three years. So if they'll allow us, I'd love to take a question or two. This doesn't imply these would be the situation for extreme fire conditions. These are just mellow fire conditions. Right, yeah, this is all prescribed fire settings. I think, you know, one of the fires was in a 71 relative humidity range. You know, I think we, we weren't allowed to go into a wildfire setting um, types of characteristics for wind behavior, temperature, relative humidity, any of that. With that said, and I think this will be discussed in sort of the literature that we put out, you know, different fire behavior response variables were impacted by other, other variables, were impacted differently. And so flame height, which we focused on in this presentation, seemed to really be driven by biomass in a way that rate of spread, for example, wasn't. So rate of spread, the, the signal was confusing. It was clear from the ground that wind is king when it comes to rate of spread. But I, and I, and I know this too from playing around with the behave plus model that uh, Felix mentioned. I mean, when you manipulate biomass, it really has an impact on flame height much less so in rate of spread and then vice versa wind in sort of more extreme fire weather conditions isn't necessarily augmenting flame height as much as you might think Wait, question. Uh, this, this is a great answering my earlier question appreciate that and your conversation there and also just good good research on this idea of how this affects herbaceous biomass i'm curious if you are all aware or maybe felix um if we're looking at if there are other researchers looking at, at this in in shrubland type ecosystems because you know we're talking a lot about the problems with shrub encroachment and all that is this being done in those ecosystems 
or something similar to this. I know there's a lot of research um, that's been done over the past decades on the concerns over conversion to brush type landscapes. Um, and I think that there's less. I know John Keeley and, and members of folks down south have done research on fire behavior in shrublands, but um, I don't know if anything manipulated about the, um, the degree to which a brush invasion has occurred has been studied. I'm not aware of any work ongoing currently that's looked that's similar to this is sort of manipulating brush treatments to different levels and measuring fire behavior. Well, I'd like to get, ask a really complicated question. Um, you're showing uh, the good effects of grazing, let's just say, um, particularly on one component of a fire, which includes um, escape and, and fire. I'm really interested in the good effects of fire as well. However, when I try to dig into the literature on that, it's the same thing I think you encountered trying to dig into the literature on grazing effects on fire. It's not there. It doesn't, it doesn't say, oh, this is good. Although we all know, and John Keeling would know, and others would know, it's really good for the landscape and these ecosystems. Any hints, any bibliographies, anything in your mind that we might start thinking? I mean, I would love to see a, a sister presentation exactly on that issue about the good effects of fire because it works right back into the good effects of fire management. Um, I know it's a complicated question. You don't need to answer it, but I, I'd like to see that. It's just, it's a, a long time professional interest of mine, which I can't really dig into because it's just not there. And by good effects, do you mostly mean plant community change that you're, you know, the desired plant community? Let's, let's just say ecosystem. I'm a soil guy. You know, I know a lot about soils and fire response. That's right, soil response to fires. Um, I'm interested in vegetation response to fires because I have to work on that particular issue all the time and very little on the soil's response to fires. But to answer your question, no ecosystems, not just one component is plants, one component is animals, one component is soils, one component is geomorphology, one component is hydrology, you know, on and on. I think it's maybe a good rhetorical question and a good place to end, but I will say, and I'm, I'm sort of embarrassed that I didn't think about it and sort of answer or address it with two questions, which is a project that's evolving down in Santa Barbara County where I work is at the Cedric Reserve, working with uh, UCSD professors and others, looking at this question in, in Coastal Bay Scrub. I mean, part of the issue, right, is that it's, we can't talk blanketly about brush in California. I mean, there are these really distinct and discrete systems that respond differently to fire. Frank Davis, who I'm working with down there at UCSB's point is that these are really understudied systems, sort of embarrassingly so as California range scientists. And so with the coastal sage scrub project, we are looking at fuel loading and coastal sage scrub in particular, for looking at fire return intervals, so we're intentionally reburning at discrete, at, at specific uh, uh, lengths. And so I think that, you know, to your rhetorical question, there, there's work that needs to be done, and perhaps it can help sort of support the narrative that I think is developing in today's this afternoon's meeting. Thank you.